Okay, so this is great. Now, another thing that you've, you've written about in the past and spoken about is that people who consume more fruit in their diet in particular uh, tend to have less insulin resistance than those who don't eat as much fruit. So can you give us a little insight here into how eating fruit in particular can help also establish an optimal omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid range? Okay, that's awesome. And that's a little bit of an extensive answer. I'm going to do my best to condense it as much as possible. Um, so I'm going to pick up where I left off also with, uh, with explaining fat before. And, and, and in the omega-3 world, you know, people tout the benefits of omega-3s, and, and I'm, I'm all for that. But then the whole big issue with, with plant-based diets is that they say there's this, so I mentioned the omega-3 essential fats called alpha-linolenic acid, otherwise known as ALA. But they say, yeah, 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 but that's not the most important thing. We need the stuff from fish oil. We need the omega-3 fats called EPA and DHA. And EPA, in a nutshell, helps keep inflammation under control in the body, important for so many things. And DHA helps our brain work well, and it helps our hormones work properly. And so there's this whole big issue where people say, okay, you can get ALA from fruits and vegetables and from flax and chia seeds, but the body doesn't do a good job converting that into EPA and DHA, where, where the rubber hits the road. And so as far as that goes, which also directly relates to fatty acid balance and helping your blood sugar work right because of the insulin receptor, um, there have been a lot of studies where they have looked at people living in the modern world, you know, near major universities where they do these studies, and they have given them some extra ALA, and then they've measured them for DHA levels a little later on to try to see of that ALA, how much in the body got converted into the good stuff, into EPA and DHA. And EPA always seems to be no problem. There's plenty of EPA there, but a lot of studies have shown the body doesn't make much DHA. So therefore, they consider DHA to be an essential fat. Like our body can't make much of it, so it's essential. So we need fish or maybe special types of algae. And what's interesting, and, and I know Robbie loves this analogy, is that is, is, is the body takes the omega-3 essential fat, fat and it converts it to the other members of the omega-3 family. With omega-6 fats, we said you can get enough of those from fruits and vegetables, but omega-6 fats are found in overabundance in corn, cottonseed, and in soybean oil. And any processed food just about is going to have an overabundance of those oils in there. So most people in the world are eating way more omega-6s compared to omega-3s. And so what happens is the same set of enzymes that does the omega-3 converting also does the omega-6 converting. So when you eat a lot of omega-6s, which most people in these studies do, those enzymes are so busy working on the omega-6s that it inhibits the omega-3 conversion because they're, they're occupied elsewhere. So therefore, their conclusion is nobody converts omega-3s well. Well, I got fascinated by this idea uh, years ago, and I thought to myself, well, at least in theory, if you didn't eat too many omega-6s and, and you ate enough omega-3s, your body should do that conversion really well. So first person I tested, this was back in 2006, was my wife, and her levels of DHA were solid. I'm like, man, that's cool. I tested myself next, and my levels were solid. I'm thinking, I think my brain works pretty well, and you know, my insulin receptor works well and all. I was happy to see I had enough DHA. And then the first actual outside patient I tested was uh, your, your host, your co-host here, Robbie. Uh, we knew a mutual friend and Robbie was new on his, uh, and new and enthused about his uh, low fat raw vegan diet, wanted to make sure uh, all his bases were covered. So I sent him the testing kit, he went to the lab, we, we got some results and his profile was awesome. He was actually quite a bit higher in DHA than I was and I was like, man, I'm not used to being outdone when it comes to raw vegan nutrition. And this guy cranks, so I, I, I had some respect for him uh, early on. And so, again, that's part of why I'm really happy to be here like a decade later with you guys. And then Robbie shared with me uh, recently that um, he, he got a test just recently and switched to a, another company that I've been using for the last uh, three or four years now also. They make it really easy. They, they, you get a take-home kit, you prick your finger, you put some samples of blood on a card, you mail it back to them in their prepaid envelope, 
and uh, you get the results in a little while. And actually, um, let's see if I can figure out the technology in there. We want to actually show Robbie's results here to help answer your question. So let's see. So here we go. And I'm going to make this full screen. And so there we've got Robbie. And can you guys see my, uh, my cursor circling Robbie's name? Yep, looks great. Okay, awesome. So there's a lot to look at here, but we're just going to do really quickly. We're going to take a look. And excuse me if I'm not looking right at the camera. I'm, I'm looking over at my screen. My camera's off to the side. So here's this stuff called ALA, the omega-3 essential fat. Our body cannot make it. We absolutely need it. It's absolutely essential. Well, he's getting some of that from his greens and from his fruit and uh, maybe a few chia seeds here and there. He's in good shape. So then the big question is, can the body make this stuff EPA and this stuff DHA out of this stuff ALA? And they don't give you a reference range here because it depends. But in my book, greater than about two or so percent of your fatty acids in your cell membranes we're looking at here, not just floating in your blood, um, greater than about 2% is pretty solid for DHA. Robbie's at just about 4%. So that's awesome. And since I've tested Robbie, I didn't do this test. He, he did this test on his own, and this is uh, recent. Um, since I've tested Robbie, I've had like 30 or 35 additional tests that I've done over the years as part of my consulting practice on people who are on a raw vegan diet. And out of 35 people, about 30 of them have excellent profiles. And the ones that don't have such good profiles, they're eating too many omega-6s. And so the question is, if DHA is in Robbie's cells here, but he doesn't have an outside source, how did it get there? And the answer is, it converted from ALA into DHA. And so my wife, Myself, Robbie, I was starting to get the idea. And then, you know, 30 or so more people years later, and we, we keep seeing the same thing over and over. And in, my, in our Mastering Raw Food Nutrition curriculum, I, I show all those case histories with the names uh, removed. And I always ask the question, okay, how did this DHA get there if there's no outside source? And they get sick of hearing this, and the answer is it converted it from ALA. So, Dr. Rick, um, could you go into a little bit of detail here about the uh, omega-6 analysis on that same screen? Because you've showed us how you can convert ALA into EPA and DHA, but then there's also a whole block of information about Robbie's omega-6 uh, fatty acid balance. And then, more specifically, does he have enough omega-6? Does he have too much omega-6? And how about the omega-6 to omega-3 balance? Yeah, so awesome question, and let, let's bring that back up again here. So we can see that Robbie's in the 89th percentile for omega-3s, and he's in the, the first percentile for omega-6s. So, And this is actually good. So compared to the average junk food eating, oil guzzling, even though they're not guzzling it, they're guzzling oil in, in the form of the processed foods that they're eating that are high in corn, cottonseed, and soybean oil, Compared to those people, Robbie's way higher in omega-3s and way lower in omega-6s. Now, is this enough omega-6? Even though he's below the reference range, it, it's enough. He's not suffering from various issues related to omega-6 deficiency, which a lot of them are the same as omega-3 deficiency. And that, that gets a little more complicated. So this is a classic example where the reference ranges are based on the average person out there eating an unhealthy diet. And oftentimes uh, what I see in my population of people who are eating plant-based and, and raw food diets, the reference ranges, we sometimes have to adjust those a little bit for real health, for what's truly healthy versus what is the norm out there. So even though this looks a little low based on these standards, that's a really solid range. And, and tying into what we were saying before about the conversion, because the omega-6s are appropriately low and not excessive like they are with most people, the enzymes that convert the omega-6 family are not overburdened by dealing with too many omega-6s. Therefore, he can convert ALA into EPA and DHA effectively because those enzymes are available to do that. If, if you had to uh, calculate Robbie's omega-6 to omega-3 balance or omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, what would that ratio actually be? 
All right, let me look into my crystal ball here at the bottom of the screen. They actually tell you that. So it's 2.2 to one. And, and that's extremely good. When people are e even like six or eight to one, that's still good. So, so Robbie's super awesome for that. And one of the things that does, and, and by the way, the, what, what's in the body is different than, a little bit different than the dietary omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. Uh, generally speaking, we don't want to eat more than about four times more omega-6 fats compared to omega-3 fats. That helps get, and, and to finally answer your insulin question here, when we have a healthy mix of fats in our body that gets incorporated into our cell membranes, that the part of the membrane that separates the outside from the inside, that helps the various hormone receptors that are, that are embedded within the cell membrane including the insulin receptor, work properly. So to get to your question, so basically having a healthy fatty acid profile, which you get from fruits and vegetables, which is so great, that the mix of saturated and monounsaturated and omega-6s and omega-3s is excellent in fruits and vegetables. And the fat that, okay, so then, then we have cells. So here's a cell. There we go, my earbud thing. Here's a cell, right? And then here's your bloodstream out here. And in order for glucose to get out of the bloodstream and then into the cell, it has to go through the cell membrane. And the cell membrane is made largely out of fat. And the mix of fat in your cell membrane is indicative of the mix of fat that goes into your mouth. And when you've got a healthy mix of fat, the insulin receptor works properly. Now, here's the problem. People get misinformed and they're afraid of carbohydrates. And then within the raw food community, that translates into they're afraid of fruit. As you guys know, most fruit's actually low on the glycemic index. So, but, but when people are afraid of fruit, then what they do is they end up getting a lot more of their calories from fat. And the challenge with that is most of those concentrated fat sources are actually much higher in omega-6 fats compared to omega-3 fats. And when I see, and it's pretty clear when I see the results, when I see someone with enough ALA, but not enough DHA, unlike Robbie, almost all of the time, their omega-6 levels are quite a bit higher. And so almonds, for example, avocados, um, things that we, um, olives, you know, people hear, oh, those have mostly monounsaturated fats. But a lot of those foods have about a quarter of, their, of the fat in there is omega-6 fat, and, and a negligible amount is omega-3. So, the, I, and, and I, actually, I got, a, I got a kind of a fun slide to show you uh, uh, for that. So here we have a half a cup of soaked almonds, and here we have three heads of lettuce. And people might, and people oftentimes, when they don't eat a high fruit diet, or they go low on fruit, they eat a lot of vegetables, which is great, and they might eat, but you can't get enough calories from vegetables. You just can't do it. No matter how much you put in there, you cannot eat enough lettuce to sustain yourself over the long term. You're just not going to get enough calories. So if you're shunning fruit, you're going to eat more fat. So in this example here, far more of the calories come from these soaked almonds than come from lettuce. And if you wanted to get the same amount of calories from lettuce as you would from these almonds, you would have to eat a fourth head of lettuce, a fifth head of lettuce, a sixth head of lettuce, and you, there's still more calories in the almonds. You'd have to go another half a head, and I'm gonna spread that around. Lettuce there has the same amount of calories as the almonds. And so most people don't eat nearly that much. They might eat, I mean, maybe, probably more like a head or two of lettuce and a little bit of almonds, and then they think, oh, that's low fat because the almonds are concentrated in fat, but I ate so many more vegetables, there must not be much fat. But the fact is, in this example, we've got uh, the same amount of calories, as you can see on the left there, from lettuce and from almonds. So almost half of the calories, about half of the calories in that meal are from fat. If you eat a head or two of lettuce and a little bit of almonds, 60, 70, 80% of the calories come from fat. And I know, Dr. Kambata, you like to talk about the extra intramyocellular fat that interferes with glucose getting into the cells. And then when you add that to what I'm talking about with now we have too many omega-6s, 
and not enough omega-3s in our cell membranes, which doesn't provide the appropriate environment for the insulin receptor to work properly, because that's the environment where the insulin receptor lives, or receptors, plural, then we've got a quantity issue and a quality issue for fat, both conspiring, if you will, to create insulin resistance. And the irony there is you're avoiding fruit, but you're creating insulin resistance. So the bottom line then is when we eat more fruit, we get a significant amount of calories from fruit. Therefore, we're not getting as many calories from fat. So our fat content comes down. And when the fat content comes down, number one, subjectively, most people feel lighter and better and have a greater overall sense of well-being like i was explaining at the beginning they are in a better mood their brain works better they're more intellectually sharp and so that all happens and then in addition to that because we lower the fat content and improve the fatty acid profile we help the insulin receptor function properly because the insulin receptor lives within the cell membrane which is made out of fatty acids and when you provide the right environment for the insulin receptor, it works properly and therefore it can easily handle the healthy carbohydrates coming in from fruit. And so when fruit intake goes up, blood sugar level actually comes down. And I've seen that over and over and over again. And, and Robbie and Cyrus, you guys have seen that more than me. And it sounds backwards to most people, but when we start to understand some of the uh, inner workings of the physiology, um, it, it actually occurs. And that's such good news because fruit's delicious, it's easy to digest, it's super nutritious, and you can include an abundance of it in your diet and still dramatically improve your blood sugar profile and so many other things at the same time.